She was heralded as the next Steve Jobs, and the world's youngest self-made female billionaire splashed across the cover of Forbes and held up as an inspiration for women in science everywhere. Hollywood superstar Jennifer Lawrence was lined up to portray her in a big screen adaptation of her life, and Amanda Seyfried later did. In 2014, Elizabeth Holmes was the darling of medical entrepreneurship, a college dropout who'd founded a multi-billion dollar company that would revolutionize healthcare. There was just one small problem. The foundation of everything she built was deception. And over the space of just a few years, her life and her company would come crashing down to unbelievable lows. But how did she keep up the charade for so long? How did she build a well-respected board, raise hundreds of millions in funding, and fool almost everyone around her? This is the rise and fall of healthcare giant Theranos. Elizabeth Holmes was born in Washington, D.C. in 1984 to Noelle Ann and Christian Rasmus Holmes IV, a vice president at Enron. Yes, that Enron. But if you thought that such a close relationship to one of the biggest accounting frauds in history would make investors wary of her, you'll see. Holmes benefited from the sort of upbringing that helped her get into Stanford in 2002 to study chemical engineering. It was there that she began her aspirations to develop game-changing health technology. Maybe it was a genuine passion for helping people and fighting against the extortion of the U.S. healthcare system. Or maybe she simply saw an opportunity to achieve a lifelong dream of becoming a billionaire. Holmes came from a proud and moneyed family, and according to a family friend, her and her parents yearned for the days of yore, when the family was one of the richest in America. In 2003, she founded her company, initially called Real-Time Cures, but soon changed to Theranos, a combination of the words therapy and diagnosis. The premise was simple. Holmes wanted to create a way to run hundreds of blood tests from just a single finger prick. Existing technology typically required an entire vial of blood for a single or small set of diagnostic tests. Holmes envisioned a process where huge amounts of data could be extracted in a fast, inexpensive, and virtually painless process. In 2004, she dropped out of Stanford to work on the idea full-time, using money that had been earmarked for her education. Far from being a sign of failure, her status as a college dropout turned entrepreneur gave her something in common with Apple co-founders Steve Jobs and Larry Ellison, Oracle's co-founder who would later invest in Theranos. Theranos' flagship product, the Edison Machine, the size of a home printer, was invented to perform the analysis that would normally require a whole lab's worth of equipment. It was going to be a game changer. The dream of making personalized healthcare a routine and affordable part of people's lives was a tantalizing vision indeed. So much so that Holmes wouldn't take no for an answer. When she initially pitched her idea to several professors at Stanford, they told her it was impossible. Professor of Medicine Phyllis Gardner was one of those who tried to convince Holmes of how overambitious she was being. But when has that ever stopped a Silicon Valley disruptor? Undeterred, Holmes eventually convinced her Stanford advisor Channing Robertson to join her. Biotech scientist Ian Gibbons was another early hire and added further credibility to the company, which by then had already raised several million dollars in seed funding. But the big bucks and the big names were still to come. Further investors included Oracle's Ellison and famed venture capitalists Don Lucas Sr. and Tim Draper. Meanwhile, Holmes was building an all-star board, starting with former U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz, who then convinced a host of former defense secretaries, senators, and CEOs to get involved. While it was an impressive list of figures and well-positioned to garner support and further funding, what it notably lacked was significant expertise in the medical technology they were trying to build. Yet, not that many people knew that at the time, from the very beginning, Theranos was a very secretive organization. For a decade, it had no website and did no press. What's more, even investors weren't party to exactly how the technology worked, and no matter how many millions in funding rolled in, Holmes had the final say on everything. She claimed the company was operating in stealth mode and even took multiple employees to court to keep details of Theranos secret. In 2009, software engineer Sonny Balwani joined the company as president and COO. Unbeknownst to many at the time, was the romantic relationship between Balwani and Holmes, perhaps because Balwani was 20 years older than his CEO. Her obsession with secrecy was another callback to the style of Steve Jobs, who Holmes further sought to imitate, even copying his iconic black turtleneck look. 
She went so far as to furnish her office to look like his and adopted a deeper voice for work and interviews. In 2013, Theranos was officially introduced to the world with much fanfare. By this point, the company had raised hundreds of millions in funding from names like Rupert Murdoch, the Walton family, and Betsy DeVos, and its valuation was in the billions. That valuation would peak around $10 billion in 2015, by which time Theranos had high-profile partnerships with Capital Blue Cross, Cleveland Clinic, and Walgreens. The Walgreens deal was arguably the biggest, seen as a first step towards all their pharmacies across the country offering Theranos tests. The perceived traction propelled Holmes into the spotlight. She was soon plastering the covers of business magazines as the woman who could own the future. But it wasn't long before events would be put in motion that would eventually leave Holmes owning not very much at all. At its peak, Theranos employed more than 800 people, and it was one of these employees, Tyler Schultz, grandson of then Theranos director George Schultz, who played a key role in its downfall. Tyler had concerns about much of what he saw around him and had taken these to Theranos management, only to be dismissed and intimidated. He turned then to John Carreru, an investigative reporter at the Wall Street Journal, who began building an explosive expose. Erica Chung, a Theranos lab assistant who'd been ridiculed for her concerns by Sonny Balwani, provided a second insider source, and Carreru published a scathing attack on Theranos in October 2015. Holmes immediately went into press mode, adamantly denying the claims, but there was little she could do, and the wheels would soon come off at astonishing speed. The Safeway deal collapsed in November, Walgreens suspended its services and expansion plans, and by mid-2016, Theranos was in the mire. The FDA, SEC, and federal investigators were just some of the groups suddenly scrutinizing Theranos, and they would soon find that every astonishing claim Carreru had made in his Wall Street Journal piece was correct. The famous Edison machines simply didn't work. Erica Chung's later testimony told the courts that you'd have about the same luck flipping a coin as to whether your results were right or wrong. The machines routinely failed quality control tests, and results were cherry-picked from them to falsify their accuracy rates. Theranos was either gambling with people's lives by using the machines to give essentially random results, or simply running the tests on other commercially available machines. Either way, everyone from the general public to the company's partners, investors, and even employees were being lied to. Over the next two years, suspensions, sanctions, and lawsuits followed as investors, investigators, and regulators all discovered the truth. Holmes and Balwani were accused of multiple counts of fraud before Theranos was shut down in September 2018. From the peak of its $10 billion valuation, there was nothing left. Holmes had plummeted from the world's youngest self-made female billionaire to a penniless woman facing a raft of criminal charges. In November 2022, Holmes was sentenced to more than 11 years in prison after being found guilty of defrauding investors. Astonishingly, she was not found guilty of defrauding patients. She had argued that she was misled by staff and controlled by Balwani. By then, the two of them had ended their relationship. Balwani faced similar charges and was found guilty of all of them, receiving an even longer sentence in a separate trial. What do you think of Holmes being found not guilty while Balwani was? Let us know in the comments.